But when we start a garden, we have high expectations, don't we? And hopes that everything will be perfect. But very often, we're visited by some, <laughs> some things that uh, might be problematic. So <clears throat> the thing is that we have to have some information, some way of dealing with some of these problems that arise. And it's not like they're, uh, they're major, major problems. Uh, and you'll, you'll see why. But the first, the very first avenue of approach to pest problems is prevention. It's just like human health. If we want to stay healthy, the best way is to take care of yourself and prevent uh, a lot of things uh, from arising that might be uh, a problem. So good gardening practices are the very best defense against pests in the garden. So conscious care of the soil and its microorganisms, uh, using a lot of organic matter uh, and mulch and keeping the pH between six and seven is a good start. Uh, creating a biodiverse ecological garden. Now, I'll talk a little bit more about that in the, at the end of the program, but this is a very, very important uh, feature of any kind of pest control program. And it's also a lot of fun that you're growing a lot of things, not just the food plants that you desire, but a lot of things in conjunction, maybe flowers, herbs, other things, which will affect the pest population in your garden. Uh, applying organic fertilizers and minerals uh, to your soil. Uh, that's very helpful in keeping the fertility up. Careful watering practices. Uh, that means if, you're, if you have plants in the garden that are prone to a fungus uh, attack, uh, you don't want to water the leaves of those plants and you want to water in, in the morning so that plants or the soil has a chance to dry off a little bit uh, with the heat of the day or the sun. Uh, because wet leaves, wet conditions, poor air circulation are a real contributor to uh, fungus diseases. Planting and harvesting at the right times, uh, that's very important. A lot of people don't really know when to plant. And if, if you're not sure of the planting times, you need to get a planting schedule and keep it posted where you can refer to it. Because if you plant really out of season, you're, you're inviting problems. And if you don't harvest when the food is ready, then, then you're gonna lose your, your, your produce. And you're gonna provide places for uh, insects or pests, uh, other pests to uh, to take uh, refuge, using the least harmful uh, controls. That's, that's really important. Going along with that is, and you'll see later on, is identifying the pest, the problem. So, and regular monitoring of the garden, I think that's one of the very most important things you can do in terms of prevention and limiting any kind of damage you have from pests. Go in the garden and look at the plants at least twice a week, if not three times a week. Go and see what's happening. You may be surprised. So I, I think that's, that's the first and last step in terms of prevention. All right, types of insect damage. Sucking, chewing, boring, and mining. Sucking, chewing, boring, and mining. Sucking, chewing, boring, and mining. You know, the first thing we have to do when we see damage is we have to maybe apply those terms and see what kind of damage is it. Is it, it, is it sucking? Uh, is it uh, chewing, boring, or is it a minor? Uh, and uh, that will be a help to identifying the pest because most of the time you don't see the pest doing the damage. Sometimes it happens at night or when you're away or they're, they're hidden. So. Uh, if, you, if you can identify the type of damage, then you can uh, work towards identifying the pest. The uh, sucking damage you see there, this is uh, 
What do you notice there, particularly? Huh? Well, the leaves are the color. That's, that's the key. The leaves are not green the way they should be, right? They're kind of off color or yellow. The chlorophyll is missing. It's not green and vital and healthy. All right, the chewing is, chewing insect damage is pretty obvious. It looks like it was probably a bean beetle that did that. Boring insects are sometimes very difficult to see unless you find a hole in the stem of a plant like zucchini or other squashes and you find frass, which is like sawdust. Uh, then you know you've got a boring insect. And mining uh, insects, uh, they actually operate between the top surface and the lower surface of the leaf. There's an insect that lays its egg there and the larva tunnels inside the leaf and it leaves that kind of trail. Uh, it happens a lot with uh, spinach in the garden. That's the most vulnerable plant to, uh, to mining damage in the garden. All right, here's a, a very common pest that a lot of people know about, aphids. Uh, aphids usually happen on new soft growth and usually at the tips of plants. So, and they congregate in en masse. And uh, so the remedies for that are, uh, you can actually, if they're not too extensive, you can spray them off with a hard jet of water. If they're limited to uh, one part of the plant, you could actually prune that part of the plant off and dispose of it. It's another method. You can use a homemade spray of oil uh, and soap, vegetable oil, dish soap with water. Uh, some people add uh, baking soda to it too. That, that's a very good uh, spray material for small insects, aphids uh, in particular. Now, there's a ladybug. Uh, la ladybugs, uh, very often, uh, you find them around uh, aphids. They consume the aphids, and the larva, which is on the uh, right, to your right there, that's the larva eating the black aphids. They eat more uh, aphids than the adults do. But you need to learn to recognize the larva so you don't think it's a pest. Everybody can uh, identify that the beetle shape. That's not a problem, but the larva is, uh, it looks like uh, it might be potentially damaging to your plants, but it's not. The beetles. All right, a, a big class of uh, insects that uh, can do some serious damage. The bean leaf beetle, uh, you saw the picture earlier uh, with the damage on the leaf. Cucumber beetle, Colorado potato beetle, and the flea beetle. The flea beetle is very often on eggplants. Uh, they, they can do a lot of damage. All of these insects can do a lot of damage. So if there are not too many of the beetles, you can hand pick them off and drop them in a, a jar of soapy water. Um, or spray if you, you need to feel you need to spray because you have a large crop or you've got a lot of insects, uh, neem would probably be the, the best choice. Neem is an absolutely amazing uh, product because it'll take care of a huge range of insects and a huge range of uh, diseases as well. However, you don't want to go to a, a spray uh, unless you have to go to a spray. If you try to avoid that because beneficial insects will be damaged too by even by using uh, organic type sprays. Caterpillars, lots of caterpillars in the garden. Pickle worm, 
Uh, they're quite small, so you don't see them until there's a lot of them, uh, and, or you see the damage showing up. But uh, the sp uh, most likely you couldn't handpick those because they're too many and too small. But BT is a spray. It's a, actually it's a, a biological spray. It's a disease of caterpillars. You spray it on the plant, the uh, caterpillars will eat the, the leaf and ingest it and it, it upsets their digestion and they die within a few days. It's very, very effective against caterpillars. So, <clears throat> you see there the cabbage worm and, and the moth, this pretty little white moth that uh, actually deposits its eggs on the cabbage family plants and uh, you get the cabbage worm. Cutworms will cut your seedlings right at ground level. They abide in the soil and then they come out in the evening and if you've got small seedlings, uh, that's what they like to dine on. So they, they'll cut them off at soil level. Tomato hornworm, once you've seen tomato hornworm, you don't forget it, right? <laughs> It can be as big as that finger. Yeah. And it's usually, you know, it's colored the same as, as the tomato leaf. So it's disguised. However, if you see a lot of sawdust around your, your tomato plant on the, on the leaves or something, look, look above. You may find a tomato hornworm. Uh, and that, that thing can damage a, a tomato plant pretty seriously in one night. It's, got, it's a big worm and it's got a big appetite. Slugs, snails, and weevils. When I first started my garden at home, I had a lot of snails. Uh, so the remedies for those, and, and they like moist places, dark and moist places. And they you come out at night, and you usually identify them through their slime trails. They have slime trails over the plants, or if you have mulch around there, maybe you'll see it on the mulch. Uh, but you can handpick snails, uh, traps for snails or, or slugs, a board put in the garden and left. During the day they'll migrate there. You can go later in the day, lift the board and find the snails or slugs there. Or you can use a half a grapefruit, empty grapefruit. So if you have, if you, have uh, you know, snail or slug problems, uh, just once you eat the half a grapefruit, bring it out into the garden and, and, and turn it over. They'll go under there and you can, and you can find them easily. Or beer. How many of you use beer? Uh, does it work? For pill bugs, it works for pill bugs. Yeah. Uh, it's very effective. However, it's very messy. It's really messy. You get a, a lot of slugs in a, a can or a little container of uh, beer, which you normally sink into the ground, pretty close to ground level. And they're attracted, I believe, to the yeast. And they'll fall in there and they'll drown. Sweet potato weevil. Well, it's, you see the potato there? It, it looks, it's the larva of this insect that you see that creates all those indentations in the, uh, in, in the potato. And it can be pretty ugly and unappetizing. Uh, so that's, uh, that can be a problem. We've, we've had some damage like that at, at, at the Faith House Garden. So I don't know very many remedies for that other than crop rotation. Don't go, keep growing sweet potatoes in the same place all the time. And sanitation, if you, uh, it's probably good to get rid of uh, any potatoes that are questionable or uh, just keep the area clean. And if you have a serious problem with sweet potato weevil, uh, you may also want to consider destroying the foliage rather than composting it. Some other insect pests, uh, white fly, uh, that can be a real serious problem and they, they multiply very, very fast. Uh, I think in this area, the, the plant that they're most interested in. Guavas. They love guavas. They love guavas? Okay. Tomatoes, certainly tomatoes they will get on. Papayas. Papayas too? Beans. Beans? Okay. Yeah. So they uh, They also turn the leaf black, don't they? 
that black? They're bird? sucking insects. Well, yeah. my koala was just inundated, and they just, they, after they were there, I think I sprayed it. I think I sprayed it for something like me. I'm not positive. Yeah. Um, all this black soot like. That's stuff. sooty mold. Sooty mold. You see that on, on plants, ornamental plants, or sometimes vegetables. It's. Uh, you get the exudate or the droppings from the insects, in this case white fly you mentioned, that come on the lower leaves and then the sooty mole grows on that. Yeah. So the sooty mole itself won't kill the plant, but if, it, if, if the whole plant is covered with the mold, then the plant will have trouble getting light. Uh, if you see the sooty mold, you can, you can water, spray it off, wash it off. But, but the basic problem is sucking insects up there. It could be aphids or white flies or mealybugs. Yeah. You know, uh, you know ben, ben mentioned too, he had some trouble with, was it white flies? Oh, spider mites, okay. Well, the white flies, anyway, uh, yellow sticky cards. I don't know if you've ever seen them. They're, they're sold in garden centers. It's simply a Usually a little plastic card like this that you hang in the garden. And insects are attracted to yellow. White flies are very attracted to yellow sticky cards. So that's a, you know, a non-spray way of, of reducing the population. Scale, uh, now this is not the greatest picture of scale. You see a few dark spots there. Right in the middle there's one, uh, up near the top of the leaf is another one, and up on the leaf stem there's another. It's like a little brown, uh, it almost looks like a beetle, but it doesn't move. That's the adult scale. The immatures will move, uh, but the, not the adult. Uh, they're sucking insects also. Uh, they're very uh, susceptible to die from uh, an oil soap spray. So any of these small insects, if you can get oil on them, it smothers them. It smothers the eggs as well. So uh, that's, that's a very good approach. <clears throat> Spider mites are, are difficult, difficult one. Uh, they like hot, dry situations. So the first approach to try is when, if you have spider mites. And they're, they're very, very tiny. Sometimes you can't even see them. Uh, sometimes you need a, a, a magnifying glass to see them. However, they often leave little webs around. And very often you can, <clears throat> you can identify the presence of spider mites from the webs. Now in that case, you can use water uh, very forcefully, excuse me, <clears throat> forcefully, especially underneath the leaves of the plants. Uh, but you have to monitor spider mites very carefully. They, they populations can just explode very, very fast. So neem would probably be a, another uh, possibility. Okay, so those are just uh, eggs. I'm not sure what species they are, but uh, that's up against the stem on, on the underside of a leaf. So, you, you know, it helps if you're suspecting you've got any problems to occasionally turn over uh, Turn over a leaf and take a look. Take a, take a look under the underside of leaves. Uh, there's a leaf miner on spinach. Very interesting, you know, uh, life uh, lifestyle of that insect there. Uh, once once the larva is in there, it's hard to use a spray to get rid of it. You know, uh, so it, it the damage is usually pretty light from what I've seen. You don't tend to get masses of damaged leaves. So hand picking is a very viable uh, way of getting rid of it. Uh, and I would destroy those leaves. Nematodes are, uh, are a real problem in sandy soil and we have sandy soil. So, And uh, then there's the squash bug. Uh, squashes are, and squashes and cucumbers are the hardest things for me to grow. They're the ones that get insect problems and disease problems pretty regularly. Uh, here, they're, here we're recommending floating row covers. What that is is simply uh, little hoops on the ground with some netting over it to keep the, uh, keep the insect out. You know. So that's one possibility. 
Uh, if you have the bug, you can, you can trap it similar to uh, trapping the s uh, snails and slugs under a board uh, or spray with a garlic, uh, onion or garlic spray or with neem. For the squash bugs, yes. Oh, and, and the nematodes here, uh, the cover crop. Uh, I understand some help, sun hemp is helpful. The ants' connection with aphids is very important to understand. Ants will actually farm aphids. They'll bring them up on the plants, and then they'll go collect the honeydew. They bring them down into their ant uh, tunnels and farm them down there, use them as slaves to create uh, honeydew. So, and ants are one of the few uh, insect species or other species, species other than humans that make war on their own species. Interesting, interesting insect there. So if you have uh, aphids on a plant and you see ant traffic going up and down, that's what's going on. So you could also put tanglefoot, which is a sticky substance at the base of the plant, and the, the ants won't have that access. All right, uh, now these are beneficial insects that are considered predators or parasitoid insects. Uh, on the left is the insect that's the predator. On the right is the, uh, the food that they, uh, they eat. So the dragonfly eats mosquito larvae. The uh, assassin and pirate bugs uh, will eat insects with exoskeletons. Those are hard-shelled uh, insects. Hoverflies, also called syrphid flies, uh, eat many small insects. So you see on and on here. Um, the solitary bees, that's interesting, uh, they will take small insects and they will put them in their, their uh, hive. Uh, it's not a hive, actually, they're solitary, in their, where they raise young. And it becomes food for the larva. Having these, these folks in the garden is a big asset. You wanna have a diversity of insect population in your garden so that they can balance the, each other out. Here's more beneficial insects. You've seen the picture of the lady larva before. There's a syrphid fly. Looks a lot like a bee, except flies have only two wings. Now, the braconid wasp, very interesting. Uh, in the uh, lower left, that wasp is injecting uh, an aphid with its stinger. In the middle picture, those are the larvae of the braconid wasp consuming a tomato hornworm. If you ever see this in your garden, and it's a possibility, don't pick that hornworm, leave it. They will suck out all the innards of the hornworm and you'll have all of these wasps in, in, your, in your garden in that area to do more of that if, if they can. And the lacewing is uh, uh, quite a uh, consumer of small insects, aphids, uh, white flies, and things like that. Uh, it's got clear wings. So there's a lacewing and there's a lace bug. The lace bug is a problem. The lace wing is a, is a beneficial insect. All right, let's look a little bit at diseases. Diseases are very hard to identify. Powdery mildew is probably the disease that's most common. It's, you see the graying on the foliage. Uh, happens to uh, cucumbers, squashes, uh, a lot of plants. Uh, most of these diseases like uh, damp conditions and uh, powdery mildew comes on uh, in the fall when uh, there's still dampness, still humidity in the air and the temperatures uh, get cooler. Yeah, so powdery mildew, uh, that's, you can expect that in the fall. Tomato blight, uh, there's all sorts of blights and disease problems on tomatoes and it's getting worse. 
it's, it's really getting to be a problem. Uh, and then bacterial spot is, uh, happens to tomatoes and peppers. Uh, uh, tomatoes and peppers seem to have similar uh, disease problems because they're in the same family. Downy mildew is a problem on squashes and uh, they can turn pretty ugly quickly. Uh, blossom end rot is a, basically a physiological problem. It comes often from uh, uh, uneven watering. That happens on tomatoes and sometimes on peppers, but uh, tomatoes in particular, the bottom part of the, the uh, tomato, the fruit will turn black. Uh, it's, it's pretty ugly. Uh, sometimes a lack of calcium in the soil too will, will do that. So calcium can be added with, uh, with lime. Uh, that's a cucumber virus there. Uh, cucumbers and, to and tomatoes are not the easiest things to grow. Back to disease prevention again. Resistant varieties, well we just talked about that. Right? That's important if you're having problems uh, with a particular type of, of vegetable. Good air circulation and plant spacing. That's critical for plants that get, uh, tend to get disease problems. And we talked about irrigation early in the day. Uh, that is if you're using overhead irrigation, if, if the plants are gonna get wet, do it early in the day only. If you have drip irrigation where uh, the leaves don't get wet, then you can, you can water at any time. And sanitation. Uh, you know, removing any plants that are full of insects or disease and getting them out of the garden, not in the compost pile, but into the trash. Get them away from your property. Uh, and if you do any pruning on diseased tomatoes or anything, you should wipe your pruners with alcohol. And uh, weeds, not only just in your beds, but surrounding your garden. If you have a lot of weeds, those are places where a lot of insects or disease diseases can hide and stay alive and propagate. And so that's a consideration. As I mentioned, even botanical sprays can be toxic to people, certain types, uh, and to beneficial insects. So you want to limit the amount of spraying you do and use other methods if you can. Uh, so tolerate a certain amount of damage. If you have a few holes in, in the leaf, it's not a major issue. You're not going to most likely sell the produce. And uh, so tolerate a certain, uh, one author that I really uh, uh, respect, he's in California, Frank Tozer, he's written some wonderful uh, gardening books. Uh, he says he, he tolerates up to 20%. So at least, <clears throat> And then make sure you identify pests that you have, identify them correctly. And if you need help, you get help. A cooperative extension in Largo will help uh, identify your plants, or a, garden, a good garden center will help you identify your pests. If they're insects, if you can capture one and put it in a jar and take it to the, uh, to the garden center, uh, that's, that may be a good way to get it in. Make sure you have a top on the jar. <laughs> People in garden centers don't like people walking in with a lot of pests, you know, especially if they're out in the open. So, <laughs> so again, trying to be a little conservative in your use of any kind of spring material. But if you're going to be conservative, you've got to monitor on a daily basis. If you've had a problem, you've sprayed just a section of your, say, uh, your pepper plants or whatever, uh, you've got to follow up for days and see if the, if the damage is continuing, if the insects are proliferating. Uh, so monitoring the garden is just, just really important. Uh, here's a few things you may want to take a few notes there. I did mention the, uh, the homemade spray in a cup of water. This is one teaspoon of vegetable oil, one teaspoon of baking soda, one teaspoon of dish soap. You can drop the baking soda out and still have an effective spray there. But um, uh, you know, this, this recipe will even work on roses, black spot on roses if you have roses. Uh, and that's, that's a tough one if you grow 
ever-grown roses. And a neem oil, as I mentioned, is just an incredible product. But again, uh, it's, it's the heavy duty of the organic sprays, so I wouldn't use it unless you have to. And EM, essential microorganisms, uh, not many people know of this, uh, it was developed in Japan, and uh, it's an amazing product. It has an amazing future. Uh, it's extremely beneficial to the soil, to plants. Uh, it's got many, many industrial uses, household cleaning uses, all kinds of uses. It's used as a probiotic. Uh, not necessarily the same product that you would use in the garden, but by the same company and the same basic uh, st strategy. But it, it, it provides a lot of uh, bacteria on the plants and in the ground, beneficial bacteria, which will compete with, uh, with uh, challenging bacteria. Compost teas, well made, uh, will do the same thing. You wouldn't have to buy the EM. If you're making good compost tea, aerated, uh, it's normally uh, you put a little uh, aquarium uh, aerator in a five gallon bucket with a couple of cups of uh, compost, good compost, and you know, fill it with water and then bubble it overnight, and you've got a good product, a good fertilizer, which will add a lot of um, microorganisms to your plants or your garden. And, and you normally feed a little molasses in there to feed the microorganisms. I think this, uh, this needs a lot more uh, investigation by all of us. You know, using comp making good compost tea, using it for fertilizer, but also using the sprays on, uh, to, uh, as a preventive for uh, insect or disease problems. And I, I read one interesting point about it was that the, uh, apparently the, uh, these microorganisms will uh, uh, attach to the food that these insects eat and then they ingest the beneficial bacteria and it's, uh, it's an issue for them. So, so if you're gonna spray, don't spray in a really hot part of the day, particularly if it's a hot time of the year, and uh, you wanna be sure you spray on both sides of the leaves, so. Ah, uh, this has become uh, a real issue <laughs> in urban agriculture. So if any of you have good suggestions, uh, I don't have the answers here, but here's a lot of possibilities. Uh, Maybe we need to use all of them. <laughs> Disguising your plants, actually, that's a serious suggestion. <laughs> I don't mean putting a mustache on them. <laughs> oh, I don't think any of you have deer in your gardens, but sometimes people live in areas where there are deer. And I, I read this very interesting thing about laying chicken wire flat on the ground around your, uh, your garden because they, they have hooves, right? And the hooves get stuck on the, on the uh, netting, so they, they don't like it. So, yeah, that's a very interesting idea. Okay, the ecological garden. This is really an important concept, you know, as important as prevention. It's to try to create a garden that's, you know, that's full of biodiversity having flowers in there, having herbs in there, having uh, all kinds of different animals, small animals in there, birds, toads, frogs, lizards, and snakes. They're all part of the ecological system in a garden. And, you know, we, we have not, we've gotten away from thinking about our gardens as ecological systems. And uh, we need to get back to that and, and, and recognize that there's a, lot, there's a lot of nature that is willing to help us grow food if we bring it into the garden. So having native plants there uh, will bring a lot of birds in. Uh, having flowers, particularly, uh, uh, it's nice to have dill and, and fennel and parsley. They attract butterflies very strongly. And that, the larvae are caterpillars, you know, which will eat some of those plants. But uh, uh, and then small flowers for some of the smaller uh, predatory uh, insects, like the hoverflies and so forth. So you need to, yeah, to, to mix up the garden. 
And uh, mixed plantings, as I said, uh, will often disguise uh, some of the plants you're trying to grow for food. So, uh, and this, this makes gardening a lot of fun because uh, you get a lot of surprises. Aesthetically, it can be very nice. And uh, it's certainly in terms of pest control, it's a big assist. Okay, here's a, a few key points, general points. Plants have immune systems, immune defenses. Very often they will develop chemical defenses against certain insects. That's the evolutionary process takes care of that over many, many years for a long time. Uh, plants can develop that way. Uh, if the plants are healthy, they have the ability to uh, resist pests very often. And plants, just like people, they want to grow to maturity and set flower and set seed so that they reproduce, right? So they have that urge. So uh, everything wants to fulfill its purpose. And the last uh, little phrase there, healthy soil equals healthy plants equals healthy people. That was uh, Sir Albert Howard was the father of organic agriculture, and that was his big statement, you know, that the health of people depends on the health of the soil. And that's the biodynamic movement, the organic movement, uh, they all recognize, they recognize that fact. All right.